All right, everybody, welcome back. We are on module four. Um, this is gonna be our first mediums unit, which is talking about the different types of um, art making mediums that um, we've kind of discussed a little bit before, but now we're doing a deep dive on all of them. So um, lesson eight begins us with drawing. Um, it's a really natural kind of place to start when you first are learning about the different mediums. Um, and oftentimes people's first uh, experience with art making is with drawing. Um, drawing by definition is an immediate and accessible way to communicate through imagery. So the first um, image I've got here for you is uh, by Henry Moore. It's called his shelter drawings. Um, he did a lot of these, but um, I just showed this picture usually first because um, it's it's a, a really good example of how helpful drawing can be, especially um, may, maybe not in this manner so much anymore, but um, especially before like, you know, the late 1800s, before we had cameras, before we had, you know, different ways of documenting information really other than just writing. Um, drawing was really, really useful for helping people understand um, what was going on in the world that they couldn't visibly see in person. Um, and so this was Henry Moore's shelter drawings. It was um, the Lunder Londoners sheltering from Nazi bombing raids. Um, and it's a valuable record of events where cameras could not function. Um, and then Moore was named an official war artist for this, uh, for, for these drawings that he did. Um, so let's back up a little bit and talk about the drawing process, just kind of early on where it begins uh, at and how we, you know, first kind of make contact with it. Um, oftentimes when you're a child, you often um, will draw before you read or write or communicate any other way, um, verbal or like in written language. Um, the meaning of drawing is simply to pull, push and drag marking tools across the surface to leave a line or a mark. Um, and then another kind of important little, you know, beginning part that I've got here is about sketchbooks. Um, lots of times, you know, whether an artist is an artist who, you know, their medium is drawing, like that's what they do. Most artists will carry sketchbooks to kind of jot down their ideas and notes and things like that, almost like a notebook, but, you know, with a visual component to it. Um, one of the most famous examples of this is Leonardo da Vinci's um, journals or sketchbooks that he kept. He has hundreds of these, but um, a lot of the times you'll see some of the drawings from this, like the Vitruvian man and um, a lot of his anatomy studies that the pieces themselves look like finished works, but they're his sketchbooks and he, it helped him to sort of like document things as, you know, he was seeing them and understanding them and, you know, he could visually come back to these drawings and, um, you know, see what he had learned. Um, another example, example I have is Guillermo del Toro, who is a famous director. Um, he directed uh, the new Pinocchio movie, um, or you know, one of the new Pinocchio movies, not the the um, really cheesy one, but the kind of like stop animation one. Um, he he also directed Pan's Labyrinth, um, and he usually keep keeps sketchbooks like for each of his movies that he directs so that he can kind of jot down his ideas as he's going. Obviously, there's a lot more writing going on in this one than um, the sketchbook page from Leonardo da Vinci. Um, but, you know, he has some character development here and, you know, kind of is able to visually communicate his wild ideas to those that are producing the movies. Um, so I've got a little little excerpt on here about the drawing process. Uh, there is receptive and projective drawing. Receptive drawing tends to lean into um, attempting to capture things that are physically appearing before us the way that they are appearing. So I've got this Mary Cassette um, uh, sketch here done on a train. It is um, captured, it's a captured family group or a captured family group on public, public transportation. And she's meaning to capture this quite literally. It's, it's receptive. She's, you know, trying to translate what she is seeing in front of her into a drawing. Um, but she's not taking any like real, you know, liberties here. She's kind of in the beginnings of this sketch, but, you know, I don't think that she's trying to go way too far from what it is that she's visually seeing, which is a, a, a trait of receptive drawing. Alternatively, projective drawing. Um, this is when we are drawing something that only exists in our minds. So, you know, fantasy drawing, um, which is, you know, a lot of, a lot of drawings and artwork that we see is fantasy. Um, it's not things that exist naturally to us. This is kind of an extreme example, but um, this is another uh, example of someone drawing on a train. Um, you know, her her view of it is quite literally what it is. And this is sort of a, um, you know, exciting, um, 
you know, fantastical um, example of what uh, Ramirez is seeing opposed to, you know, just drawing what he sees directly in front of him the way that it is. <clears throat> so let's get into why drawing is important. There's so many parts of drawing that become so important to just the art process in general. Um, so drawing in the creative process, many artists regard drawing as deeply important and some artists present exceptional abilities as children, but some have to develop it, including artists like Vincent van Gogh, which is probably our most recognized name in art history. Um, so Van Gogh was not someone who just was naturally inclined to drawing and to, you know, being a good artist. He wanted to. And so, you know, art is definitely one of those things that, you know, if you practice and you, you know, keep going back and, you know, doing it over and over again, um, you can make some really good strides and become a really successful artist. It doesn't have to be the just, you know, right out of the womb that you are talented at drawing. I think that that's a lot of kind of misconceptions, especially early on, um, once we get out of like, you know, elementary school where we don't really have a lot of limitations to us, we're just doing things because it's fun. We start to get competitive about, you know, how well someone naturally is at something. Um, and definitely myself included, you know, I, I am one of these people who, um, you know, I was okay at drawing and okay at art. And I wasn't really that sure that that's, you know, something that I was good enough at to do professionally, but, um, you know, a lot of practice came with it and I, you know, I followed through with what I wanted to do. Um, but I wasn't someone who naturally was just inclined to be, you know, that one person in class who's just the superstar at, at drawing and, and painting and everything they do. Um, but yeah, that's a little, my little tangent, but um, let's go back to Van Gogh for a second and kind of his journey with um, becoming a good artist and, you know, where he kind of came, came from. So um, the first drawing that I see here or that I'm, I'm showing here is this top one here um, where the man is standing. This is a uh, carpenter compared to old man or carpenter is the name of this one. This like little sketch that he did and then old man with his head head in his hands is the one that he made here. Um, these are two years apart. And um, you can tell that there is a lot of strides being made between these two drawings. The first one here. Um, scale and proportion are just kind of awkward, kind of squished. It almost looks like this person's legs are much shorter than they should be. And the torso and the arms are a little bit longer, which is something that naturally happens when you start drawing at first and you don't know how to, you know, correctly draw human proportions to one another. Sometimes you'll get too close to the edge and you want to fit everything in. And so you, you know, just kind of compact it to make it look a little bit shorter. Um, but then the, the proportions are off. So, you know, it's probably the better idea just to let it kind of go off the page there and be naturally what it would be like in real life um you can tell that in this one his uh his shading and his value that we've talked about with like the elements of art has gotten a lot stronger he has a lot more um variation in that so I, I know going back to my like one through ten value scale we can see here that we have like you know some ones and some twos like on the lighter side and then we've got like some nines and tens like the darkest side of the, the value scale but here we have a nice range and that's what you want to see with drawing is like you know kind of touching on every point in the value scale, one through 10, you know, having your your highlights and your lightest tones, your mid tones, and then having some shadows in the middle and then having your core shadows and your, you know, all of, all of the different categories of light can be seen here. Um, so let's talk about some reasons to draw, why, why people choose to draw things. Um, really, if we break it down, there are three main functions to what makes a good artist. Um, the first makes, sorry, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> there are three functions that art serve, that drawing serves. The first one is a notation or a sketch or recording of something seen, um, remembered or imagined. So this was really helpful, especially like early on when we had to jot things down really quickly and there wasn't a way, another way to document the things that we saw. So, you know, instead of just pulling our iPhones out and taking a picture of a landscape that we thought was beautiful, um, you would have to sketch that to remember it. Um, but sketching does serve a lot of other purposes now to um, just sort of to, you know, jot your ideas down quickly. Maybe if you have an idea that can't be, you know, captured with a camera that's more on the, um, the like more fantasy side of drawing, then a, a sketch is a good way to do that. Um, the second one is a study or preparation for another larger and more complex work. That is um, super, super helpful, especially if you're doing something like a painting or a sculpture. Um, a study of that, you know, oftentimes kind of like, you know, rules out some, uh, some things that might have gone wrong if you just went straight headfirst into like the final project product. 
Um, this is, you know, saved me a lot of time and energy in the, in the long run by planning out my artworks in advance so that I don't, you know, run into the issues when I'm at a later stage of it. And I've, you know, already put in hours and hours of work. And then I realize, oh, I, you know, don't need to go any farther in this direction, or, you know, this didn't turn out the way that I thought it would in my brain. Um, so that's really, really helpful for especially painters, sculpture, sculpture artists, things like that. And then lastly is an end in itself, um, a complete work of art. So I'm gonna go through a couple examples of these. Um, this is an example of sketching being done for, for, you know, kind of a study, I guess, for a larger work as well. But um, this is Michelangelo's uh, studies for one of his larger works, the Sistine Chapel ceiling um, and the Adam uh, and God uh, little bit of that. Um, yeah, so this is just carefully drawn from observation or rep repetition of parts needing further study. So um, this this does, I think, I, now that I'm kind of reading back through it, um, this does actually, I think, fall more into like the sketching category because although it is studying for a larger work, it's not like a rendition of what is to be. This is just him like doing a little study, a little practice drawing of a probably like, you know, real life figure drawing um, in front of him, but not so much like, you know, the whole gist of what's going to happen this is just like the the singular body without you know all of the other sort of like fantasy stuff happening on the right side that we know studies for a larger work this is uh, Picasso's Guernica um one of the probably most famous artworks in the entire world um there are 45 studies that are preserved that have been done in preparation for Guernica um there are, you know, the ones that are like these that are just simply kind of mapping out like the the elements and kind of how they're going to fit on the the canvas. Um, you know, so very early on, you can't even like really tell what this is going to be yet. This is like a kind of midway through one, probably, you know, getting some values in place, actually finishing some of the subject matter to see what it's going to look like. Um, and then our last one here is the finished product. Um, and then this is a friend of mine, actually, Amory Williams, um, Buchanan now, um, but she is a, a person I went to school with. She was in graduate school with me, and she is a professional drawer, that her, her medium that she chooses. Um, she uh, does usually like colored pencil, watercolor, marker drawings, and things like that, but um, this is one of her pieces that she showed in our, um, our graduate show. Um, so going through a couple of tools and techniques, because there's a lot <laughs> with drawing, it's not just like pen and paper, paper that categorize like, you know, what drawing is. And there's some, a few kind of unconventional ones that you might not think would fit into this category. So let's kind of go through those real quick. I've just got them listed up here, kind of some of the ones that we'll talk about. Um, well, hang on. Oh, maybe that's my only one. <laughs> so we'll talk about um, pencil first. So this is just, you know, what you would what you would expect a pencil to look like, you know, the kind of variation in the mark making that it can produce. Um, compressed charcoal, which is our, um, it's, it's a very dark medium. Um, it's uh, good for adding a lot of value into there, getting like your nines and tens. And you can have a good bit of variation to it as well um, with like the thickness and thinness of the lines. Next is our vine charcoal, really great for like studies and um, creating like really good gesture lines. Um, lots of variation can happen. You can actually just even turn it on its side because the whole thing is like a medium. So it can, you know, create really, really bold lines if you want it to. But charcoals are really great for, for studies and for, you know, preparing for larger works. Brush and ink which um, even more so like watercolor drawings, um, you wouldn't think really sometimes that brush and ink are ones that would fit into the drawing category because it's more of like a paint medium, um, but you will definitely learn about brush and ink and watercolor drawing um, or painting when you take a drawing class. Um, lots of good variation here. Sometimes even like, you know, color, if you have, you know, colored inks or colored um, watercolors that you, you use with it as well. Pen and ink, a um, couple of different kinds here. We've got like the ballpoint pens, um, or not ballpoint pens, we've got the um, the fountain pens here that can create a lot of like variation and it's, um, you can do like calligraphy and things like that with it. And then lastly, our ball ballpoint pen that creates a pretty pretty standard line. It's There's not a lot of variation with it. So um, going through some different types of line um, and what, you know, different mediums can create. 
The first kind of technique that I've got here is hatching. Um, the parallel lines suggest shadows or volume. Um, we've got cross hatching and contour hatching. So the first one here is just straight, plain forward hatching. Um, it's going in one direction. All the lines are parallel to one another. Um, and this is really great, but it, it, it sort of does, you know, have its limitations to it. Cross hatching is pretty much the same thing, but you can get a lot darker value because you're cross, you're quite literally literally crossing the lines and making them perpendicular to one another. So you can see here how the the value gets a lot more intense when you are able to cross them together. Um, and then lastly, contour hatching, which is you are following the contours of an object to um, you know kind of make the shape out a little bit better than just doing it like you know left and right here it's it's sort of this is sort of like a flat version of cross hatching and or a flat version of hatching um, while this has a lot more sort of depth to it Sorry, my voice is giving out a little bit um this is an example of all three of those hatching methods uh kind of used together in one drawing we can see the cross hatching being used here um, we can see just regular hatching being used on the background, sort of. Um, I think that's a good way to sort of uh, show some depth as well as just using just plain hatching without any like, you know, cross hatching or contour hatching used. Um, it's good to sort of push information back. It's not as detailed as like this foreground information here that's obviously closest to us due to like the vertical placement and overlapping and other things. Um, but you can see that the contours are being followed with the lines of like the arm and the body. Um, and then we can also see the cross hatching being used to make this a lot darker values than the ones in the back there. Oh, and then I have a little thing here about printmaking. Um, printmakers use all three types of hatching to suggest mass and shadow. So um, I think a lot of the times we think about we, we would rely on like smudging and, um, you know, sort of shading in like a, a way that we just sort of smudge things together. Um, but printmaking, which we'll get to later on, um, does not allow for that. So um, we have to, every mark that we make is the ones that will translate to our final print. So it's important to, you know, know these techniques of drawing really well so that you can then, um, you know, have a really successful print. Um, more sort of just definitions about tools and techniques. A substrate is a material that can be drawn on or painted on. So that could be like a canvas, um, paper, um, cardboard, you know, there's, there's tons of different kinds of substrates. Anything that you can draw on or paint on, um, is considered to be a substrate, but we'll talk about the more conventional one a little bit. So, um, paper with drawing, um, you can have either a smooth surface or a surface with a little bit of a tooth to it. I've got an example here of, um, a surface that has sort of a tooth to it and how you can, you know, be intentional about the papers that you choose to draw on. Um, this one here is great because it's supposed to sort of give this illusion of this being sort of like a fuzzy memory. Um, this is George Sherratt's Let Go. Um, and he wants it to kind of feel like it's it's a little fuzzy, a little grainy. And so instead of like, you know, creating this texture, like an implied texture, it just exists naturally with him drawing on this type of paper. It, it gives this grainy effect to it. So um, papers come in all kinds of like smooth smoothnesses and um, more like toothy textures. Um, and it just, you know, depending on what kind of drawing you want to make would depend on the kind of paper that you got. Um, okay, so here's what I knew I knew I would come back to this. So um, going through the dry mediums and the um, the wet mediums a little bit more just to, uh, just to kind of continue on with that other slide that I was talking about. Um, dry mediums are going to include pencil, charcoal, conte crayon, and pastel. Um, and this is one I believe this is the, this is using uh, conte crayon, uh, conte crayons, which are I didn't that's the only one that I didn't really talk about in pastels. Um, earlier on but Conte crayon is sort of it's like a waxy um it, it's like a crayon <laughs> um but instead of uh like actual like wax being used for it um I believe it's like a graphite powder or like concentrate um but it does feel kind of waxy even though it's not wax um this is not something that's usually used for like a final product it's more so used for like sketchbooks and things like that um but sometimes Conte crayon can can make its way into to finished pieces and then pastels. Um, I don't think I have an example of pastels, maybe, but oh, yep, I do, I do. Um, pastels, we can see here, um, allow for color, um, have similar characteristics in natural chalk, and mostly um, is just pigment with little binding materials. So um, along with charcoal, which I'll, I'll go to right here, um, 
not all binding sur- or particles will bind to the surface for pastels or for charcoal mediums. Um, and so you have to either like spray it with a fixative or sometimes you can leave it open. And um, like with this piece here, for example, this person has just put like charcoal powder over this entire drawing or piece of paper and then gone back in with like an eraser or some sort of like um, object that will remove the charcoal could be like a, you know, a, a brush with some water on it even and created the spider web from the negative space. Um, so everything that seems like it's positive space here is actually negative space. There is no, there's no medium down there. It's just like the, the absence of medium that has created the drawing. Um, so yeah, that's, but when the fixative is sprayed down, the particles will bind more to the surface, but without that fixative, um, which is just kind of like a, like a, a clear spray paint <laughs> is what I would, I would compare it to. Um, it, it won't have like a binded, uh, part down to the, the paper. Um, this is also, I used this example earlier on, but, um, this is also an example of Conte crayon. Um, there we go. Graphite mixed with clay. I don't use Conte crayon a lot, so I'm not like super, super familiar with it, but, um, graphite mixed with clay is, uh, how you get a Conte crayon. Um, it resists smudging with similar variations of char of charcoal though. Um, and typically like wax crayons, like Crayola crayons are mediums that aren't really seen by serious artists, quote unquote. But um, I would argue that, you know, that's that's maybe not true, especially like in our contemporary artwork. And then lastly, um, our pastels. So although there is like a painstaking amount of detail in this piece, um, I do have listed here that it does not allow for much detail naturally. Um, this artist has a, you know, crazy control to um, the medium, but they, um, this is, uh, Rosa Ball, um, Carrera, um, and the, the pigment here or the, the control that she has here, um, is just insane for, for this medium. And it's not an easy medium to get this much control with. Okay. So moving forward a little bit about some, um, some other tools and techniques, we've got liquid mediums as well. So pen, ink, watercolor, and marker are all examples of wet mediums. So, Obviously, you can think about like the, the you know, you have to have ink, which is liquid for, for most of these. Um, this can include brown and black washes of ink thinned um, with water, felt and fiber tipped marker pens. Um, this is a drawing by Hakusai, who created the Great Wave of uh, Kawasawa. Ka I can never say it right, but the Great Wave painting that, that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, this is done with a brush and... Um, brush and ink or brush and um, watercolor. Um, and you know, there's just like a ton of good variation in the lines happening here. It's just a line drawing, like a contour drawing where, you know, there's not a whole lot of, um, you know, detail in the insides of it. Um, but all of the lines on the exterior give for like a really nice, like flow, very good sort of like balance and organization to the piece. Um, and this kind of brush is used for the same reasons that are the same purposes of uh, writing and drawing as well, or the same brush is used for writing and drawing. So like with calligraphy and, um, you know, other types of writing, um, the same kind of brush is used for drawing as well. Um, something to just kind of note, and just as I'm moving on here, um, we have comics and graphic novels that definitely stem from drawers, um, people who create, you know, comic book drawings and illustrations, um, and usually it does stem from drawing. Um, this is a comic is a sequential art form based on drawing. It's a culmination of development through ancient Egyptian murals, medieval tapestries, um, and print series from the 1730s. So um, there's a lot of rich history when it comes to comics. You would maybe think it didn't happen until like, you know, we started seeing more like newspapers and things like that in like the 20s and 30s. Um, but we definitely, you know, have seen comics in other parts of life for a very long time. Um, this is Little Nemo and Slumberland. It was featured in newspapers for a while. And I think something really interesting about comics in general is that we know to read them the same way that we read a book or any other type of writing. And so artists who do comic books kind of play into like the way that we would normally read something. And so we can assume that this this story starts on the left here and goes all the way to the right and that's how we would read the little text bubbles that's how we would kind of perceive the information um so there's a lot of things that we just sort of you know our brain knows before we even you know have time to recognize that we're doing it 
Um, graphic novels, on the other hand, these are kind of like comics, but they're book length storylines. Um, they're really, really growing in not only acceptance, but popularity now, um, especially like mangas and things like that. Animes that, you know, have come from the mangas. Um, they're, they're really, really popular for sure. Um, they, they have, you know, some of the stories have, you know, hundreds of, of different graphic novels to, to tell the entire story. Um, I like to share this one as a more contemporary version of a graphic novel. Um, this is Emily Carroll's All Along the Wall. It's just like a little segment from from that. It's like the title and then like one more um, drawing. But this uh, tells the story vertically since most of our modern reading is done by scrolling on our devices. So instead of having a book that we read left to right, she's got this where we read it um, up down as we would you know scroll on tiktok or instagram or something like that and you know read different things um or you know a lot of times now we like you know have our kindles we have our um our like tablets and things like that that we can read whole stories on even like fan fiction and things like that where you just to, like quite literally scroll through the entire thing um but yeah so i think this is a very a very interesting like contemporary take on graphic novels um this little Picture's a little bit crazy. Sorry about that. Some contemporary approaches to drawing, um, drawing in combination with other media. So I always like to pr promote interdisciplinary art, um, not just trying to stick to one specific medium. But um, I've got Kara Walker here, who is just a, I, I love Kara Walker. She is a uh, installation artist and she makes her drawings um, to where like the actual walls of the galleries become the substrate. Um, she then like, it, it almost feels like an immersive experience. Like you're there. She sort of relies on silhouettes instead of it being like, you know, having detail within the drawings. Um, she uses just like the outlines of them to sort of tell the stories. This combines, uh, drawing, printmaking, installation, paintings, and more. And she creates these large scale installations to discuss themes such as gender, race, and identity. And then lastly, um, some more contemporary approaches. We have digital art in combination with traditional mediums. This is Carla Ganes, the selfie drawings, um, where she will um, draw something like on her, you know, pen and paper, whatever it might be with markers. She'll then scan it into Photoshop and then manipulate it more so, add text, add more layers of color, um, crop or duplicate things. And then she'll sometimes print it back out, draw on top of it again. And it's just this back and forth process. So, you know, I think a lot of where art is headed is in a digital format. Um, and, you know, we see that with our, our different tablets, with our, um, you know, different like programs and Photoshop and things like that. And so I think that leaning into it in this way where we sort of combine the traditional with the like more contemporary um, is, is really interesting. It has a lot of potential to sort of, you know, shape the way that we we think about drawing today. Um, so yeah, that is all on our drawing lesson. Um, jump back in in our second video and we will go over painting, which is uh, the, the kind of next natural step from drawing.